This Formula One car has 1,400 horsepower. That's 400 more than the F1 cars of today. It was all about engineers pushing machines beyond the limits of technology at the time, creating monsters. But they had one main issue. They loved to blow up. Turbos rocked up in Formula One out of nowhere. Let me explain. Since 1966, you were allowed to create engines in any format, as long as it was a maximum capacity of three liters. And teams ran all sorts of engines, inline fours, V6s, V8s, V16s, the lot. But there was only one rule they ignored. You were allowed forced induction engines, but they had to be less than 1.5 litres in capacity. So they were allowed turbos and superchargers, but nobody ran them. You'll know the magic a turbo can bring for performance already. It's likely your road car will have a turbo. They're everywhere these days. And it's not like they weren't popular back in the 60s and 70s. There were road cars like the Oldsmobile Cutlass Jetfire and the Chevrolet Corvair Monza Spider were both turbocharged. And it was very common in the aerospace industry too. But all of the F1 teams elected for the simpler and lighter format of the 3 litre naturally aspirated engines. Many were using the Ford Cosworth DFV engine that soon became an icon in Formula 1. It was light, powerful, reliable and most importantly cheap. But that was until Renault rocked up. They wanted to get an F1 but were going to do it differently. They'd been gaining experience with turbo engines down to their Le Mans project. The mad looking Renault Alpine A443 eventually won in 1978 with their 2 litre V6 engine that was producing up to 600 horsepower, an experience that would be valuable for Formula One. This success was put down to the extensive testing they'd done before the race, running more than 10,000 miles on a track in a single season. So Renault developed their 1.5 litre turbo V6 engine alongside the 2 litre sports car engine. Then in 1977, Renault started the iconic turbo era with the RS01, the first turbocharged Formula One car ever. And look at the size of that turbo, it's absolutely enormous, creating more than two bar of boost and around 510 horsepower. It was by far the most powerful on the grid. In fact, it was creating so much boost they had to run a cast iron cylinder block rather than the steel or even aluminium blocks of the other cars. This massive level of boost running through anything other than an iron block would just result in an explosion. This did mean that the RS01 was overweight, but the power would make up for it. Renault would go on to enter it for the silver Grand Prix in 1977, and the car would absolutely suck. It was chronically unreliable, so much so that it wouldn't finish a single race that year. And after two years of barely finishing a race, it earned the nickname the Yellow Teapot, as it very often produced a lot of white stream from the engine cover. That's what you get for pioneering a new technology. They were running the turbos at pressures that were unheard of at the time, so much so that they needed a specifically strengthened block, and even then they would get a crack and wear within the length of one Grand Prix. And with so much boost pressure, you're adding way more fuel. So the heat then becomes an issue. In testing, the Renault would regularly melt its pistons and valves. And if they didn't go, it was because the head got blown off first. And funnily enough, the heat issue had one of the weirdest solutions. They solved it by adding more fuel. Yet they were actually using excess fuel to cool the engine, resulting in the signature flames coming out of the exhaust. And that would become a staple of the turbo era. And I think that's fantastic. Who wouldn't want to see enormous flames coming from the back of a race car? But towards the end of the 90s, 1978 season, with extensive development, the Renault stopped blowing up. And for the US Grand Prix at Watkins Glen, the car was finally quick. The power advantage that the car had meant that it was quicker at the faster circuits, and Watkins Glen is fast. There aren't really any low speed corners here, and that helped the Renault further, as with this large single turbo setup, they had years of turbo lag. So let me just show you this. It's a dynograph for a slightly later version of that car, but my point still stands. Between seven and nine 1000 RPM, the car is creating less power than the naturally aspirated cars on the grid. And with its weight penalty, this made it slow. But as you come up through the revs and more exhaust gas is propelled into that turbo, the power comes in fast. The delay before the turbo spins up is what we call turbo lag. The Renault, with its massive turbo, had a load of it. But when the turbo came unsung, the power hit you like a train. I've actually driven a later turbo F1 car and it is so hard to drive. Well, 
whilst you may be getting it on the throttle really smoothly, you have to predict when that wall of power is going to hit you. And when it comes, it comes in fast. And that's one thing in the dry, but imagine that in the wet. It wasn't just an issue for performance, it was a massive issue for the drivers, forcing them to drive around it. Etten Senna was famous for blipping the throttle through a corner when you normally wouldn't to keep the turbo spinning, meaning that he had power on the exit. For Renault, the lag would create another issue. That wall of power and torque coming in so quickly would often just blow the gearbox to pieces. But back to that race at Watkins Glen. The Renault really didn't suit the slow speed corners, but through the medium speed corners, the drivers could keep the revs higher, meaning they had more power on the exit. And Watkins Glen was the perfect track for them, and they ended up coming fourth in the race. Over the next few years, the engine remained the same at its core, but there was one main difference, the boost pressure. You can't just turn up boost pressure without the engines exploding. As you increase the power, components begin to reach their limit. I think that in any racing engine, the nearer you are to it disintegrating, in general, the better its performance will be. And as all of the teams increased boost, they came across more and more issues that needed solving. And again, one of them was heat. So Renault actually began cooling the air going into the turbo with water injection. This allowed them to turn up the boost without melting the piston. It also reduced another problem they were having, detonation. As you increase boost, the pressure inside the cylinder can get so high that the fuel spontaneously combusts, at a point in the cycle where the engine just can't handle it, often resulting in smash conrod and metal smashing through the crankcase. Not good. But this, along with loads of other tweaks, got the power up. And over the next few years, they took the F1 engine from 500 horsepower to 900 horsepower. Now, with this trade-off between reliability and power came an opportunity. The teams realized that you can alter boost pressure pretty easily by simply changing the engine control map, which controls timing, boost, fueling, and everything else the engine needs to control it to run. And you can swap this map in and out. And so came the advent of qualifying engines. In quality, you only need peak power for a lap or two. The top teams realized they could dial up their engine for a short period of time. And it didn't matter if they completely ruined the engine in the process. They would lift the engine out and put a fresh one in for the race and run that one on a more conservative map. Now, as you can imagine, as soon as Renault started performing well with turbo engines, everyone else started to follow a similar formula. One of the most famous was the BMW M12-13 engine. This was interesting in that it was an inline four engine, which meant that each cylinder was just a little larger than the V6 in most of the other cars. And therefore, stronger. It could rev to 11,500 RPM and eventually got up to over 1,400 horsepower, the most powerful engine in Formula 1 history. But that wasn't overnight. In 1983, the engine was producing 800 horsepower from 3.2 bar of boost, and that is a lot. Current F1 cars have pretty big turbos, and they run at 3.5 bar. But that's with today's technology. But by 1986, the BMW was creating so much power that they didn't even know how much. It actually maxed out BMW's dyno, which could only measure up to a measly 1,280 horsepower. The 1,400 horsepower that we know now is down to privately owned historic cars being put on modern dynos we have today. And they got to this insane number through years of development with some of the best engine designers in the world. But they did implement some old school tactics. Now, 14 1,500 horsepower is a lot. That's towards the upper end of what we can achieve with modern engines now. And that's with modern ECUs and cars with paddle shift gearboxes. These drivers were controlling these 1,400 horsepower cars that only weighed 600 kilos with manual gearboxes. Driving them with one hand at times and on tires that are nothing like the tires we have today. Absolute heroes. Over the next few years, developments came thick and fast. The teams began running the cars on toluene, an incredibly toxic fuel that allowed them to get more power from the engine as they could continue to increase the boost further without blowing up the engines. And we made a whole video all about that. The other advancement was the reduction of turbo lag and the teams all tried different ways to solve this issue. Ferrari moved to a twin turbo setup meaning you could have two smaller turbos that spin up faster but still get a similar peak boost while others stuck with one turbo but use variable geometry turbos which are super clever. They use these movable vanes to essentially mimic a smaller turbo 
in the lower revs, meaning you have less lag, and then mimic a larger turbo in the higher revs, meaning you have more peak boost. The best of both worlds. And this design is now relatively common on performance road cars. As ever, the battle commenced between the rule makers trying to slow the cars down and the teams trying to make the cars faster. So the rule makers began by stopping in race refueling and giving the teams a fixed size fuel tank so they couldn't run the engines flat out for the entire race. This resulted in a lot of cars running out of fuel on the final lap. But as ever, the engineers got clever and began cooling the fuel to make it more dense and cram more of it into the tanks. And this even goes on in club racing today. So with failing to reduce the speeds enough, over a couple of years, the FIA lowered the maximum allowed boost pressure more and more, until the turbo was finally outlawed in 1989. But that brought the next epic era of Formula One, the era of active suspension. And you can check out our video on that just here. Thanks very much for watching and I'll catch you